uh, thank you, Professor Keating. Uh, it's, it's a huge honour to, to sit beside you, um, uh, a man I've, I've, I've hugely admired for many years, um, and indeed to receive an invitation from an institute um, of which I've also followed very closely, um, both at a young age at home and also over the last uh, decade and a half from abroad. Um, so thanks to uh, Jill Donoghue, Killian Moore, um, and indeed all the members um, of the Institute for, for inviting me here. Um, I'm also extremely grateful to the uh, Defence Forces um, and to the Department of Defence and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in that uh, the, all, all, all uh, three institutions uh, massively supported Jonathan Marley and myself in, uh, in writing, researching and writing a report entitled Walking Point for Peace, which was published last year by the Centre on International Cooperation at New York University. Um, it's a real uh, testament, I think, to the confidence, the professionalism, um, and indeed the deep thinking of all these institutions um, that they, they really welcome uh, debate and dialogue um, on the future of Irish and UN peacekeeping. And I learned immensely from uh, the research experience over two years. Um, I want to go back, however, very briefly to my, to my early sort of starry-eyed uh, postgraduate days in King's College London in 2004. Um, I remember sitting around in the Strand in London in a group convened by Dr. John, or Professor John McKinley, um, uh, sort of another authority on peacekeeping operations, uh, who uh, sat us around and pointed to me as the only Irish re representative in the group. There was a lot of, actually, I was by, by far the youngest. There was a lot of military officers who served in UN operations, Indians, Pakistanis, Nepalese, Filipinos, etc., um, as well as Europeans, um, other Europeans. And he, he said, um, well, you know, Ireland really, relative to any other European country, has given most to UN peacekeeping over the years. Um, and he then asked me, he said, well, why do you think, why do the Irish uh, think that, you know, it's okay to take casualties in UN operations? And I said, well, you know, in Ireland, it's seen as a, perhaps one of the most noble vocations um, of an Irish soldier to give personal sacrifices, uh, you know, either um, in terms of work and deployment, or, but also physically in terms of risk of, uh, of injury or death. Um, that is the most noble military vocation. And this was met by sort of really stunned silence, if not amusement, by the other, including people who had served in UN operations in the room. The idea that it was somehow the most noble vocation for a soldier to do this, as opposed to die for his or her country, was uh, because obviously Ireland you know, didn't sort of face the same existential threats, perhaps, that India, Pakistan may have over the years. And, um, this was a huge surprise to them. Um, and indeed, this was also a surprise to me because I was kind of a starry-eyed um, Irish citizen immersed in the veneration of UN service. And I didn't realize the profound skepticism that was sort of around the world in terms of whether soldiers could give their lives to support the UN charter. Um, I still have a, a, an enduring respect uh, for the Irish government um, and the, the Irish people's willingness to, to tolerate deployments to difficult places and where other European countries still um, do not wish to go or withdraw from. We can only think of the recent deployment to Undorf following the withdrawal of Austria. Um, and there is a huge amount to be proud of. I mean, you only have to look at the deployment of the 53rd Infantry Group, the promotion or the uh, promotion of uh, Major General Beery as uh, Force Commander in Unifil. Um, but however, today I'm going to sort of argue, I mean, there's a lot to be so, there's a lot, there's a lot of pride there and there's a lot of, um, you know, there's an immense amount of history of service. But today I'm going to be a little bit provocative and I'm going to argue that uh, Irish exceptionalism towards the EU in a European sense is changing. And in doing so, I, I want to look at two major trends. First of all, the Irish public's ad attitudes towards UN services, and secondly, the changing Irish military expectations when it comes to UN standards, capabilities, and duty of care. <coughs> Peacekeeping has arguably never been more important. The numbers of peacekeepers have, of course, trebled since the start of the century. We're now over, from 34,000 to over 100,000, approximately 106, 107. Um, but there is a persistent malaise and European scepticism towards your UN structures and operations um, who constitute a tiny part of these overall numbers. Um, and indeed, I'd say that Ireland isn't immune from this malaise and this scepticism about UN structures and the ability of the UN to reform itself. And we only have to look what happened uh, last week in terms of uh, there are some positive green shoots in terms of NATO countries looking again at uh, UN deployments. Canada is now talking about going to South Sudan certainly going to Mali in terms of increasing uh, n numbers of troops there. Um, and you can see in terms of what is going on in South Sudan that you know, the, the importance of peacekeeping as a sort of the political uh, hard edge of the United Nations um, presence in difficult places um, and keeping the, peace, keeping the peace in exceptionally trying circumstances. 
However, to set the scene, I want to sort of, in terms of looking at the first trend, which is looking at the Irish public's sort of perception of peacekeeping, I want to sort of go back more than, well, more than 50 years, um, right back to 1960, when we uh, deployed to the Congo um, as part of the UN mission to Congo there, or UNUC. Um, and if, if you look in terms of uh, how Irish peacekeepers were perceived uh, during this period, it was very much sort of a public image close to that of missionaries, albeit peace missionaries with sort of minimal weapons for self-protection under Chapter 6. Um, Professor Hugh Strawn has very interestingly wrote about how today British soldiers um, have been excessively eulogised as victims. Um, and this, to use a, an old academic chestnut phrase, an agency reduces their agency to proactively do things. If you only see them as, 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 as definite victims and it's always being set up to be victims, then if you limit your, sort of, your willingness to deploy them in dangerous and difficult places to do dangerous and difficult things. Um, so he says that you know, we need to be careful about how we sort of over-eulogise um, military service and seeing them as victims. And I would say this is a trend that has long afflicted the defence forces. And if you look back, for example, at the Niemba ambush, the sort of first major sort of jolt of consciousness when it comes to the dangers of peacekeeping among the Irish public, you will see that um, the Irish uh, media coverage at the time reported that uh, many members of the platoon threw down their weapons and reached for their rosary beads. And this was seen as a good thing. Um, however, the, the response by the military at the time was very, very difficult. By the way, there was no evidence for this. This was sort of conjured up by, I would say, a few journalists. Um, but, but in terms of the two survivors certainly didn't talk about this but, but in terms of how the military responded you could see that Colonel Pat Curran who was the, um, when he spoke to the outgoing officers and men of the 34th Battalion going after the 33rd which the Emba uh, uh, the soldiers the, 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 the casualties from the Emba came from uh, Colonel Pat Curran gave a very uh, some called it a red faced and angry speech um, in Athlone he said that soldiers should never forget their security drill if they were sent to clear a roadblock, they should never be caught off guard. If attacked, they should know exactly what to do and not be caught by surprise. And so I suppose what I'm getting at here is that the military have always had a high degree of professionalism in terms of how they see themselves. And they never particularly wanted to be seen as victims. They wanted to do a job. They wanted to do their, you know, secure their perimeter. They wanted to make sure that they knew the security drill. Um, and if they were attacked, they'd be ready for it. So this could have was a, a very juxtaposition between how the public saw the event and, and how the military saw the event, at least some military officers. Um, by contrast, the Minister of Defence at the time, Kevin Gleeson, was sort of uninterested in the, de in the details of Niemba. Um, he was asked as to, as to why this happened. And indeed, one military officer said that, well, it wasn't particularly a surprise. Um, the, the Irish were clearing roadblocks of which Belgian mercenaries were using, uh, the, of, of roads in which Belgian mercenaries were using the roads to go and bur burn down Baluba villages and kill Baluba civilians. So by clearing the roadblocks, essentially they were seen as betting the Belgians, which wasn't necessarily a good thing in that part of the Congo at the time. But however, Minister for Defence Kevin Gleeson said that um, ultimately this was the work of savages and that uh, uh, the Congo was on a manifest path to a destiny of peace and that the Irish soldiers were helping them to get there and no other detail was necessary. This wasn't exactly an informed political approach to thinking about the Congo at the time, indeed the difficult position as to why only white troops were acceptable in that part of the Congo. Um, and indeed, Dai Kamen School, the UN Secretary General, had agreed that only white troops should serve in Katanga at Belgium and the, the United States and the UK's behest. So there's a lot wider political context here that the Irish government and I would say the Iraqis weren't looking at. And indeed, even if we go on to, to, to Lebanon, in terms of operational scrutiny or parliamentary scrutiny or government scrutiny of, of detail, something to be desired as well. It took you know, a number of decades before, for example, the deaths of Corporal Finton Hennigan, Private Mannix Armstrong, and Private Thomas Walsh were looked at by Frank Callan, a senior counsel. And indeed, he reported that, that there were some aspects of the standard operating procedures and, and intelligence um, at the time that could have been perhaps better done. Um, some mistakes could have been learned from earlier in, that, in, in, in the Irish deployment. Um, so whereas Irish officers have, who served in Lebanon have always long spoken about mistakes, ways to improve um, what they did, and indeed learned from, some, from such mistakes, no formal acknowledgement was ever forthcoming, really, of any serious problems in command and control, counter-ID preparations, equipments, ordnance, etc. Um, and generally, with some honourable exceptions, the Oireachtas was almost completely uninterested in such questions in the past. Um, even in sort of you know, ugly incidents, for example, the 2002 abuse of, of minors in Eritrea on the UNMI, or the UN mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea, this was kind of officially dismissed as a rotten apple or two, but it was, has been acknowledged by a number of officers that I spoke to who, who were um, around at the time. This was more of a sort of battalion-wide problem. 
then was perhaps acknowledged at the time. And if you think that this happened to the British Army in Iraq or something, or in Afghanistan in 2003, there would certainly be a parliamentary inquiry into that to get to the bottom of exactly how this culture and how these problems have managed to manifest themselves. But we sort of, you know, and what I, what I suppose what I'm suggesting here is sometimes the mantra of peace and the keeping of peace is sort of a comfortable blanket of which we can sort of put over our operations, which lead to sort of some comfortable uh, you know, speeches about uh, the wonderful things indeed that we do do, but perhaps also sort of limit then the willingness or desire for, for robust scrutiny in terms of operation performance um, and indeed making sure that, uh, that, that we learn from, from we, we publicly acknowledge and learn from um, each operation. And, and that, that is a healthy, it should be a healthy tension there between on the civilian side, um, you know, constantly scrutinizing uh, motor performance um, and then trying to help to uh, learn from mistakes, improve uh, whether that's the uh, purchase of equipment, whether that's the changing uh, or the uh, further funding of training exercises, um, whether that's the provision of uh, whatever extra officers are needed um, or indeed uh, uh, soldiers are needed to do uh, difficult tasks. So I would say that, however, this 20th century trend of, of political and public disinterest in closely monitoring the operation of details of peacekeeping are coming to an end. And I would say that there are a number of points which I would like to um, talk about today. Um, first of all, the general ma maintenance of professional standards in the Irish Defence Forces is quite unique, um, given the lack of parliamentary or public probity or interest in such standards. Um, and there's a very worthy PhD thesis possibly to be done on this. Um, and already high-level professionalism has accelerated of late. And indeed, Ireland's membership of part NATO Partnership for Peace since 1999 has transformed the Defence Forces. Um, Irish officers, like all professional members of their caste, want to train and deploy with the best. And this, for many Irish officers today, means NATO. Indeed, the tilt towards NATO has gone so far that many of the Irish uh, officers that we interviewed were, were unaware of some of the detail of, of recent uh, UN doctrinal innovations. So, for example, New Horizons, you mentioned that to a number of officers, they didn't really know what was in it. Um, whereas, if you talked about the most recent stand NATO standard operating procedures, absolutely clear, you know, uh, clear on NATO exercises, clear on exactly um, what NATO standards were. When it comes to some of the, new, the large amount of UN uh, paperwork on doctrine, a, do a doctrine that's produced by both the Department of Field Support and the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, well, there was perhaps less knowledge about this, and that struck us as, as surprising. Um, I would say, second, there is now evidence that Irish public attitudes previously un uninterested in operational details is much more casualty averse now when it comes to UN operations than was ever the case in the past, and that this is being reflected in turn by the Irish government. I'd say third, the Department of Defence has emerged as a thinking department, as evidenced by the well-articulated white paper on defence, and possibly the first time you could say that Ireland has produced a paper on security that can, that can be considered truly strate uh, strategic. And indeed, Ireland's contribution at the EU and NATO level is evolving. Um, it is demanding an unprecedented policy response, and the Department of Defence is generally rising to the challenge. Um, fourth, the increased role of DOD is not without some interdepartmental tension, including between the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, and the Department of Defence. Uh, but this is, again, generally healthy for policymaking. It's good to have uh, two departments rubbing up against, in, in, against each other with sort of defence favouring a certain uh, policy choice versus Department of Foreign Affairs favouring another. However, if there's no cabinet minister for defence, it obviously tilts the balance a little bit too much, perhaps, where you don't have a senior um, political leader then sort of articulating the defence line um, and that sort of it, it can unbalance things a little bit um, and so the dialogue in national security is in danger is becoming as I say slightly unbalanced there in terms of foreign affairs uh, preferences. Uh, the Department of Defence appears to favour stronger NATO engagement and more deployments as part of combined European battalions. Um, the DFA is sort of coming around to this idea but has long sort of favoured more traditional UN deployments and indeed, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade pushed hard for the 2013 UNDOF deployment to Syria, um, while the Department of Defence was largely, well, to some degree, a bit more hesitant. Um, however, in the minds of at least some Irish defence officials, uh, and indeed defence forces officers, the experience in Syria has highlighted two important shifts in Irish defence. Uh, first, Irish military standards and duty of care to Irish soldiers is much higher than it was in the 1990s, and two, UN structures are not keeping pace with these expectations. So very briefly, let's look at what went wrong in UNDOF of late. Um, well, looking at one incident, and perhaps the most famous incident in terms of the Irish Quick Response Force uh, role in, in UNDOF, on August 30th, 2014, Irish peacekeepers in Syria came under attack from Al-Qaeda's Al affiliate Jabhat al-Nusra. Al-Nusra had already kidnapped 45 Fijian uh, soldiers and seized UN disengagement uh, or UNDOF uh, bases, weapons and equipment. And then now they surrounded, fired upon, and demanded the surrender of two other U UN positions manned by Filipino peacekeepers. Irish soldiers successfully re uh, relieved the encircled Filipino peacekeepers, evacuating 93 personnel while maintaining their own security in a tense 
and highly volatile environment. However, a war of words then broke out, as we know, between the UN force commander and the Filipino government over, over whether Filipino troops disobeyed in order to surrender to al-Nusra. <coughs> Meanwhile, the UN was forced to negotiate with an al-Qaeda group in order to gain the release of the Fijian troops who were released on the 11th of September. Qatar, as we know, negotiated their release. And as an Israeli uh, politician observed, where Qatar negotiates, there's always money and a lot of it. So in terms of UNDOF, uh, well, it hasn't regained its lost positions in the Syrian Bravo sign, uh, line of the disengagement zone. And to some degree, um, this was an embarrassment in terms of command, UN command and control, having this very public spat between um, the Philippines uh, and the senior officers from the Filipino military and a UN force commander over who said and did what. And for many European countries, including the Austrian Chancellor, who said, well, we told you so, we told you this was going to happen, so that's why we withdrew our troops. It was obvious that this mission was a mess. So UN peacekeepers were essentially harassed, occasionally kidnapped for over two years by Syrian rebel fighters um, to, to enforce um, a mandate that to some degree had been rendered impossible to, to put in place. I mean, complaints were made about Jabhat al-Nusra um, by the UN to the Syrian government, saying, why don't you do something about Jabhat al-Nusra targeting our troops? Well, I mean, I'm not a fan of the Syrian government. They said, well, we're a bit, bit busy at the moment. And uh, oddly enough, they're sort of beating us in many areas of the southwest uh, Southwest Syria. So it was sort of a, a, an out of date mandate with out of date structures and uh, unworkable um, command and control ultimately when it came to dealing with crisis situations. So I would say that this has been a pretty difficult uh, experience for the Defence Forces and for the UN. Um, and indeed, at the time, Minister of Defence Simon Coveney said that uh, this showed that from now on Ireland was going to have a much more strict conditions based approach for Irish contingents following debates in Undoff in Syria. And if we look at some of the statements that came from Minister of State Paul Kyo recently when it came to the deployment of Irish troops to, to Mali, he said, we will, Irish soldiers are all deployed in relatively safe jobs and will not be active in danger zones. This isn't good, particularly, I would argue, for, in terms of getting a job done, just to stay in safe zones, um, to this sort of you know, casualty aversion, um, isn't necessarily, I don't think, what professionals want. And so I think we need to have more dialogue about what risks we're willing to take um, what uh, UN reforms we need in terms of duty of care, in terms of you know, thinking about role two, uh, hospitals, etc., in terms of how retrievable are our soldiers from uh, adverse situations. But simply saying that we're only going to send our soldiers to safe areas, relatively safe areas, and not you know, to dangerous areas is not a positive message, not a positive dialogue we need to have with the Irish uh, populace uh, as a whole, I would argue, and indeed with the Oireachtas. Um, looking briefly then at some of the problems, that, uh, and I don't have time really to get into, some, into many of the areas of report that we published last year, but looking briefly at command and control issues of which uh, many, we, t we talked to a number of Irish officers, a large amount of Irish officers, about their experiences of UN command and control. Um, so quickly speaking then about uh, some of the problems that they highlighted. Well, we still have, despite the uh, you know, various reports on UN reform, including the uh, the HIPPO report of last year, 2015, that was chaired by Ramos Horta, the former president of uh, Timor-Leste. And we still have a number of issues in terms of um, a UN uh, system infighting. Um, and one, one senior Irish UN official uh, told us that, uh, quote, the incentives of the UN system are to work for part of the UN against all other parts of the UN to capture resources. A UN staffer does not work for the UN as a whole. He or she cannot see that far. The way that the UN is created, uh, is funded, creates this, this distortion. There is not an incentive to work together. Instead, each agency is in competition for funds. A central planning process is needed to reduce this. This is what DFS, Department of Field Support, was designed for, but some in Department of Peacekeeping Operations feel threatened by the DF, DFS role. And this is certainly what we found um, throughout New York. The Department of Field Support and DPKO are going through a turf battle that is long standing um, and shows no sign of going away. Um, and in terms of, uh, EU, an EU official also pointed out that DFS does not view its role as being subservient to DPKO and that this huge interagency problems was causing uh, difficulty in terms of European appetites for further um, commitments to UN peacekeeping. Uh, also was noted that in the case of several UN missions, for example, in Minercat, there was serious uh, d disagreement with uh, UN officials over what should the, how the mandate should be interpreted. So in the case of Minercat, UN officials wanted essentially um, Minercat uh, troops to provide uh, escorts for UN agencies, whereas obviously U4 and indeed European countries saw a wider scope for the mandate than perhaps UN officials um, thought. And this was ne never quite resolved to a satisfactory outcome throughout the Irish uh, time of the Irish deployment um, in Chad. And indeed, the, the botched handover from March, April 2010 also was, uh, was frustrating, not only for the Irish, but was also noted by a number of other European countries in terms of um, how you know, EU-UN cooperation was not quite up to, up to scratch or, or where it should be. And much blame was put on the UN there, fairly or unfairly. 
In terms of looking at mandates, well, obviously mandates have, uh, for a period after the Brahimi report in 2000, uh, mandates became much more sort of means tested and orientated. However, in recent years, it's been a sort of a move away from this. The new buzzword is POC, you know, the protection of civilians. Um, and indeed, if you look at the MINUSMA mandate or our UN mission, the South Sudan mandate, then you see that um, there is a large number of tasks to which the peacekeeping peacekeepers are not particularly equipped to do whether it be um, you know, sort of ensuring that uh, gender awareness is sort of uh, prioritised or whether it's, it's ensuring that um, uh, peacekeepers sort of pave the way for successful elections. Um, and sometimes, yes, UN civilian officials should be sort of deployed alongside these missions to sort of take care of these, um, this, this range of mandate uh, tasks, but often peacekeepers find that they themselves, through a CIMIC or civil military role or um, civil affairs role, are sort of tasked with doing these things as well. And, Many countries, many TC, troop contributing countries are not capable of doing this. So the large scale, um, you know, if it's a, some Asian countries simply just ignore, uh, you know, aspects of the mandate, they find that they are not trained or equipped to do um, that they see as being traditionally civilian tasks. So MINUSMA, um, the Mali mission is, is a very, very good, broad mandate, but whether it's actually really implementable in, in, in the whole of its um, scope is, is another question. Um, the other problem for the Defence Forces is that they've had very successful and, and indeed um, pleasing experiences of recent NATO um, peacekeeping uh, missions. So, for example, the mission K4 mission in Kosovo was seen as a model of sort of multi-actor cooperation, uh, an excellent concept of operations at CONOPS, um, an excellent plan to wind down the mission, a gradual transition then to unmick the UN interim administration in Kosovo, so a logical sequential transition um, and uh, where K4 sort of moved to an aid to the civil power role. And so Kosovo, because this NATO experiences have been so good, um, this has kind of led to increased expectations in terms of what uh, Irish soldiers will then experience in, in other missions, whether those are realistic or not. Indeed, UNIFIL is a satisfying mission because to some degree the French insisted on remaking it to their image as they, as they wanted it. So they established things like, for example, uh, insisting that a French officer uh, take on in 2006 a new chief of staff role that they sort of remodeled in terms of its terms of duties to be what they would expect in a NATO mission, or insisting um, of establishing a strategic military cell in UNIFIL um, that was staffed mostly by European officers, much to the chagrin of you know, non-aligned movement countries who were sort of used to having um, a sort of, you know, an equal role in terms of operational headquarters, but this was very much dominated by Europeans. And so the French are sort of quite brash in advancing their own way of doing things as they see fit. And this is quite ad hoc, it can be useful. It can also lead to confusion, especially when it comes to other TCCs who um, have a problem with kind of advanced use of intelligence technology that they don't have, such as whether it's UAVs or anything else. Um, the establishment of national intelligence cells that they again don't have or don't want to set up. So the French have sort of set a template that what people in London right now are saying is, is an interesting template. The UK is talking about the same thing in the Ministry of Defence. Well, are you know, establishing parallel missions like Le Corne and Côte d'Ivoire, for example, and then to feeding into the UN mission as necessary as your national interest and indeed your desire to get involved with the UN sort of fluctuates depending on who, who else is commi committed to um, uh, providing troops. So it's sort of this have your cake and eat it approach is kind of is quite appealing to some European countries. I would say that's quite dangerous to Ireland in a way. In the short term, it's often quite useful, but in terms of the overall sort of coherence of peacekeeping, we need to make sure that such um, efforts are formalised, that you don't simply sort of rip up the rule book and sort of rewrite it as necessary. You don't sort of, you know, some of the recent innovations that we've seen, such as joint military analysis cells or joint operations centres, again, the French or whoever it is will sometimes rewrite these or or even the Italians and the Spanish will sort of try and remake these as they see fit, as they see as they see as kind of a better model um, on the ground at the time, depending on the force commander, depending on the key military personnel. This is all interesting, can be innovative, it can be useful, but it can also lead to confusion, um, especially when the bulk of UN peacekeepers are still obviously not from Europe and therefore can lead to some difficult relations um, in, in the mission. Finally, I'll just say that um, there's also some evidence of civilianization. So, for example, if you look at a lot of the air assets that are used in, in sub-Saharan Africa in, in very difficult uh, missions, such as in the Congo, you'll see that some of these are, are subcontracted out to civilian agencies who fall under um, ICAO kind of civilian standards. It means they can't uh, really use air assets in a, in a kind of hot conflict because that goes against civilian uh, uh, sort of you know, work rules, which is dangerous in terms of you need an Indian... Uh, you know, if an Indian company commander is calling in for a Kazavak and suddenly you realise you don't have air assets because it's too hot, it's too difficult, that doesn't exactly inspire these troops doing very difficult jobs with kind of morale. Um, and to, you know, already they're thinking that you know, Indian Pakistani troops, for example, generally do one UN tour in their whole careers. 
which is a problem actually because in terms of their previous experiences they're obviously learning on the ground but then in terms of risking their men or women's lives well if you're concerned about you know air uh, assets uh, not being you're not being able to draw upon them as a military officer then that's that's obviously um, quite difficult and i don't think that came out in the recent uh, hippo report either um, we still have problems in terms of sending troops home. However, there, is, there are some green shoots out there in terms of if you look at the UN standby arranging system that has now been done away with essentially and then we now have the peacekeeping capability readiness system that was introduced in 2015. It shows some uh, signs of improvement on the previous, uh, on the previous UNSAS um, concept. We also have the strategic force generation style which has been pushed by the UK and others um, which again is sort of pooling and allowing for a major European dialogue in terms of moving away from the French kind of ad hoc approach that I talked about to a more formalised way of getting Europe back into uh, more peacekeeping. And I think that you know, some of the moves that we've seen from Canada recently, some of the conversations that are being had in London, despite the dreadful, uh, I'll be quite frank, besides the, uh, you know, in terms of the hindrance that Brexit puts upon CSDP and, and, and a more European cooperation, whether it's the European Defence Agency or CSDP missions, etc., you know, there still are some green shoots out there in terms of trying to get uh, Ireland uh, playing a sort of leading role in trying to um, move bigger European countries away from, from possibly doing things for, for expediency, but not actually laying down a blueprint or framework for future cooperation um, and, or you know, finding ways to have different levels of UN operations. I think there, are some, there is some progress noted in the report in terms of trying to look at ways to uh, fix the budget so that uh, more capable assets can be reimbursed, for example, from the peacekeeping budget so that Europeans are not necessarily out of pocket as they complain they have been in the past. Intelligence has now been talked about openly. It's a very good thing. You can see the use of UAVs. It's very positive in my view in terms of intelligence should not be a dirty word. Um, it doesn't have to be a negative thing if done properly and carefully um, with the host country. Um, so I think there are some green shoots out there. And I'm very much welcome, given the sort of the range of immense experience that we have in this room. Um, I've tried to be a little bit provocative in trying to talk about the Irish situation, the Irish legacy. Um, my uh, sense of, again, the professionalism and the expertise that Ireland has, both in terms of the military and the Department of Defence and the Department of Foreign Affairs, is that it is very high, very engaged. Um, possibly on the military side, there could be more awareness, actually, surprisingly, even though we thought we wrote the UN peacekeeping uh, book, to some degree we've kind of lost a little bit of touch, perhaps, as we go for more and more PFP uh, training initiatives and, and NATO standards for dominating the military training discourse, perhaps we need to kind of go back and look again in terms of how we see our input and how we can learn from UN doctrine and, and advance it on the operational level. The UN produced a lot of paper. Not a lot of countries actually operationalize it in terms of how they train their troops for peacekeeping missions. And we possibly are also some way to blame for that. I think, uh, very finally, that when it comes to our major flaw is that we don't have a proper public discourse about defence in this country. So we do have ministers coming out and saying, don't worry, our soldiers will not be harmed. If our soldiers, you know, I, I think uh, gathering from the conversations that we've had in terms of professionalism, in terms of commitment, I think our soldiers do want to be in the difficult areas. I think they have been in the difficult areas. And the idea that they should only go to, as Mr. Keogh said, the relatively safe areas goes against that long and proud tradition. Um, so I'd argue that the only way we can change that is to sort of talk to the Irish public about why they do these difficult jobs, why they might possibly take casualties in the future, and why this is absolutely worth it in terms of um, Ireland's contribution to international security. Thank <music> you.